Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We're going to have a fun conversation this week about privacy, and we're going to talk about privacy in organizations a little bit, as well as personal privacy. And I think it's always interesting when security professionals talk about privacy because it's not all security and it's kind of its own subset of security. And a lot of times as security professionals, we want to be private, but then we also want to kind of have oversight over things. So we want to see what our users are doing. We want to see that traffic, but at the same time, maybe we don't want that to be the case for us. And so sometimes in organizations, there are some security shops which have the temptation of applying different policies for themselves versus users. One of the things that I always respected about my old boss, Doug Turchak, was that he only wanted policies applied to him that we were also applying to the users. He wanted to have the same exact experience. And one of those reasons is because then he can experience it and see how bad it is. And if someone's complaining about it, he can be like, well, you know, it's the same things applied to me. So, you know, it's not that bad or can kind of have some empathy around the experience. For myself, you know, one of the examples for, for me where I also kind of don't want those security policies applied is I have a separate phone for Microsoft. And those of you who've listened to the show know that, you know, with our corporate data and mobile devices, Microsoft requires Defender for Endpoint to be installed on the devices. And while it's not very invasive, it does inspect DNS traffic and can do content filtering as well. And so it's fine to have that for work purposes. But for me, I just wanted my own phone where I can dictate my own DNS or VPN if I needed to. So that, you know, is again, the same thing where, yes, I understand why Microsoft needs to have the security policies and apps on that phone to keep it safe. But I also don't want it to apply to my personal life. I kind of want to keep it separate. So that's that like separation. I think struggle that a lot of security professionals go through because again, because we do want to stay private, but we also need oversight in order to stay secure. It is a balance. And I think speaking about your, your former boss, Doug, and, and how he insisted on having the same policy applied to him, that really, really helps. When I think of my most recent employer before I came to Microsoft, I butted heads with the information security department a lot there. And again, this is like 2016, early 2017 timeframe. So times have changed and as I've had further interactions with them now being at Microsoft, I think they've evolved to a much healthier posture, but at the time it definitely felt like they operated on a principle that they were above what everyone else had to do. And it was almost like that sense of, we know better than you. So we don't need these same protections applied against us. And we're going to really inspect the heck out of everything you do. Um, while not not doing the same for ourselves. And I think that really loses any time you're trying to do change management, any time you're trying to gain buy-in, organizational buy-in to do anything, there always needs to be that leading by example, right? And that applies to anything in life well beyond information security. But if you find something you're trying to implement is onerous and would prevent you from doing your work, then guess what? It probably is doing the same to somebody else. And so again, I mean, I don't want to get off on a tangent because we're really talking about privacy, but that balance that you're positioning here, Andy is so critical. And I think as information security professionals, we are aware of the mass surveillance that can exist on the internet. 
and especially the surveillance that can exist in, in private organizations um, that are very quick to say their users should have no expectation of privacy when using company resources. And I agree with that concept theoretically, but again, it's the devil's in the details and how you implement it is most important. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today and tonight um, as we dig into privacy a little more and its interesting relationship with InfoSec. What kind of prompted some of this thought process was I saw a tweet, and this was a few months back, but it talked about some of the new Microsoft Purview communication compliance classifiers. Now, that's a mouthful. But basically, in Microsoft Purview, which is the old compliance portals, there's these classifiers that can use machine learning to detect certain content or information or behaviors and can feed different policies. Like, for example, Insider Risk. There's an Insider Risk uh, solution that Microsoft sells, and it can detect, say, for example, if you have it integrated with your onboarding and offboarding you know, product, if you say this person's going to be leaving in two weeks and then it detects a bunch of SharePoint or OneDrive downloads or something like that, then it can kind of flag it and say, well, this is a strange time frame and anonymous behavior associated with that offboarding, and maybe that person's trying to exfiltrate data before they leave. And so the new classifiers, which are all in preview currently, are really interesting when you look through them because some of these might raise an eyebrow. Like, for example, this there's a gifts and entertainment classifier and that's um, it detects messages that contain language around exchanging of gifts, gifts and entertainment in return for service, which might violate corporate policy. So a lot of corporate policy prohibits you to, you know, get a gift from a vendor in order to maybe buy their product. Right. And we have those rules as sellers at Microsoft that we can't accept those things. Um, there's other ones like stock manipulation classifier where it detects recommendations to buy, sell, or hold stock in order to manipulate the stock price. And so there's a whole list of these corporate sabotage, money laundering, sexual harassment. Um, and that kind of raises the question of, is this, too invasive. And that's really where the Twitter thread came in and was like, you know, employees may be moving their conversations to a different channel, which, you know, we kind of talked about where the intent of the security tool is to do one thing, but then it modifies the user's behavior to then circumvent the security control. And in this case, if you're trying to moderate or even detect on these things, maybe they're just going to move their conversations to like signal or something else that is not accessible. So that it's still going to happen. Right. Um, and so like, it was just interesting because I, I do think that there is very little expectation of privacy when it comes to organizations and your use of corporate email and devices. Like you should just understand that most of that stuff is detectable and searchable and discoverable within, you know, e-discovery and, and litigation. So you should be careful on what you're emailing and searching and all of that. But you know, is this too much? I think for some orgs, it probably would be, you know, if you're not in a highly regulated financial sector, healthcare, critical infrastructure, you probably don't need to do some of these classifiers. You know, it's there because we have customers who need it, who need to be regulated to different audit policies. But, you know, if you don't need it, I don't think it's something that you might want to implement. But, 
either way, you know, my takeaway is I think the biggest thing, especially like you said, Adam, with your previous org, they, they felt like they were different. And I think you should try to put yourself in the user's positions when you're designing and implementing policy and definitely communicate. Like you don't want to have these classifiers in place and not communicate it to your base of users because if you flag someone, you better believe that they're going to be talking among their peers and friends and be like, hey, you know, big brother is spying on us. Like now we're going to move somewhere else. Like if you communicate it and do it in a empathetic way to build trust, I think these can be done in the right way. But if you're trying to sneak around and, you know, be all big brother-ish, that's going to backfire in my opinion. So a little bit of historical context here. We're talking about Microsoft 365 communications compliance, or I guess Microsoft Purview communications compliance is referred to now. And the first time this was introduced to me was February of 2020. I was on site in Redmond on a Sunday in a very large uh, multi-purpose room. It's what we refer to as like big, big, big conference rooms or near theater type settings um, with a bunch of my, honestly, buddies, um, like Shannon, friend of the show, Shannon Fritz was sitting right next to me um, when this was introduced for the, for, the, for the first time. And so communications compliance, originally, you're talking about some of these new classifiers, Andy, that are coming out now um, in preview here in July and August of 2022. So this is, you know, two and a half years ago. And when it originally launched, um, the detections were for things like harassment, threats, like threatening, threatening to set the building on fire or shoot people. Um, again, harassment, like threatening language, offensive language, that sort of thing. Um, just really, really, really bad, highly unethical behaviors um, is what it was designed to detect. And to your point about, you know, taking a conversation elsewhere, um, Andy, you, and, and a couple of our friends um, who are also former modern desktop technical specialists at Microsoft, we had kind of a very free-flowing, um, water-cooler-style conversation that we had on Teams. And very little of it was work-related. So we made the decision to move the non-work-related stuff to Signal. We did do that. Um, and we kept the rest of it, um, anything work-related, in Teams. So we just kind of created a separation there just because we weren't doing any of those things, but we became concerned that it could be accidentally flagged, right? So with anything InfoSec, there is always that risk. And in fact, I would say a lot of the reason that iOS gained such an early popularity in the enterprise and why the Mac has always been popular in the enterprise, especially with like executive ranks, is because they generally have had a lighter touch of management. I think back to a couple of workplaces ago, the amount of hoops you had to jump through to get any app like approved to run on your Windows PC was nightmarish. You know, it had to go through IT asset management, it had to go through legal, it had to go through this, it had to go through that. You know, six months later, a year later, maybe you're going to get the app you need. If you had an iPad, you just download the app from the app store and do what you need to do and get work done. You know, I mean, a lot of times people's behaviors are in response to things being made too difficult or too heavy handed. So that's always a concern. However, I'll take a, take a bit of the opposite tact here. And this is where you can't please everyone all of the time. People are always going to find things to complain about. I will say that with liberal Twitter, with left-wing Twitter, one of the very common complaints is that social media companies don't do enough to detect radicalized um, domestic terrorists who are going to shoot school children and shoot up grocery stores and shoot up churches and shoot up malls and basically anywhere in America where you can get shot nowadays. Facebook, Twitter, 4chan, all of them, they don't do enough to detect when people are making legitimate threats on other people's lives. And it's because it's not good for business. It doesn't help. 
You know, Facebook would rather look the other way than actually try to solve that problem. And we're meant to believe that these huge tech companies don't have the ability to create algorithms and do that sort of moderation to detect these. I find that outrageous. Um, I agree with that. So here we are, here Microsoft is creating a tool that can detect threats, that can detect harassment, and can flag those and make those aware um, and, and bring them to the attention of, say, a compliance analyst somewhere in an organization. So they could learn early that one of their employees is disturbed and is making threats in other employees' lives or livelihood or anything else. And then I see tweets from like, and I'm, I'm not picking on her, but Leslie Carhart kind of, I, I would say, going a little far down the path of saying, oh, these classifiers could out um, – somebody in the LGBTQ community who's still closeted, or it could cause these other unintended effects. Theoretically possible, although if you look at the classifiers, I, I, I'm, I find it difficult to imagine that. But it's one of those like, well, which one do we want? You know, this is, this is one of those really challenging technology problems where here we are at Microsoft doing something to potentially help detect and thwart attack some people's lives and protecting them. And yes, there are some risks that come with that. There may be some false positives. And that's why we need empathetic, confidential, private um, viewing and, and, and analysis of these alerts that may get flagged by empathetic and understanding compliance analysts. And not every org has that. There are going to be people that abuse that. I get that. And it's one of those like, these are really challenging problems to solve, and at least we're trying to do something to make things better. We're trying to prevent insider trading, you know, people manipulating the stock market because they have inside knowledge on the financial performance of an organization. We're trying to prevent people um, from, from hurting others or harassing others. Like, those are good things. And yes, sometimes they may come with some downsides, but in this case, it's one of those I have always been an advocate for action over paralysis by analysis, right? I would rather let's try to make this better than sit in a focus group and talk about it endlessly and try to figure out a way where we can thread the needle and make everyone happy because that doesn't exist. So maybe I'm getting a little fired up here. Um, and I know some of these newer classifiers may be more interesting because like lever, stock manipulation, gifts and entertainment, those are a little different. But when I think of the first core functionality that this shipped with two and a half years ago and the original goals of it, they are they were indeed noble and were were designed with the purpose of of preserving human life. And so that's where I get a little fired up about this, where um it's easy in a tweet to kind of fire one off and and accuse um people of acting maliciously or, or not considering the, the knock-on effects. And I think it's ultimately one of those things where it's, again, there is no perfect answer, but let's do something. And so that's something I think is, is the right direction for this to head. And that raises privacy questions all its own, right? When does privacy trump safety? And heck, we could take this on another tangent. We could talk about like the Apple San Bernardino case where I've completely defended Apple's handling of that and protecting the privacy and security of iPhones around the world, even when that means we may not be able to gather all the evidence on a domestic terrorist. Um, in this case, because there's no expectation of privacy in the enterprise, nor should there be, um, I think this is actually a good thing overall. So like any conversation, it's all shades of gray, man. It's, it's not black and white in anything, but I think if we if we work from a place of trying to make a difference and trying to do the right thing, I think that's a North Star that will never completely guide us wrong. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about personal privacy, but I will tie it back to organizations at the end here. And when it comes to personal privacy, you know, there's some of us who just say, it's futile. Let's submit to the information overlords of Google and Facebook, and I'm going to use it. Um, you know, for example, my wife, like she uses Gmail and she thinks I really like getting these personalized ads. I don't care that they're monetizing my data. And there are some of us like myself who try to limit 
that telemetry as much as possible. I understand as any privacy advocate or security professional understands that you can't limit all of it, but you can severely try to hinder it for the most part. And mobile devices in specifically have moved in more and more of a positive direction to try to become more private. Like for example, now Apple and Android, you know, will prompt you whenever you install an app to verify the permissions. You can, for example, um, prompt each time you open it up, whether or not you wanted to use the location or read your text or whatever it is, right? Whatever permission it, it has, you can have it prompt each time. You can review it. You can block it if you want. You can disable them. Nothing is granted by default. Like we talked about last week, that tyranny of the default, right? The majority of people will just accept the default settings. But if you give people a choice right in the beginning, as organizations have found like Google and Facebook, people are denying the permissions. If you give them a choice to say, hey, do you want this to track you? <laughs> you want to be or tracked? Not? Yeah, people are saying no, surprise, surprise. And so I think that is a good thing. But, you know, we try not to get too political here, but, you know, as everyone knows, the Supreme Court reversed Roe v. Wade and privacy advocates were raising that alarm right away because one of the things that was pushed right out to the front was menstrual tracking apps and whether or not that data could be used to determine a person's pregnancy and if it could be used as evidence if a state wants to prosecute that person who obtains a termination and even location tracking right have they crossed over to a state that allows an abortion and then cross back and so i think in general some of that may be overstated it's not completely unfounded but it does surface the larger discussion about pretty much every app and the data that it's using and whether or not it can be weaponized against us. Um, you know, the Democratic uh, caucus was calling to Google to try to ask them to stop some of their location tracking for this. And Google did comply. They deleted location history for users visiting certain sensitive types of medical facilities, including abortion clinics. And so I think that was a good thing on Google's part. And I hope other tech companies who are utilizing data will kind of follow suit. Additionally, the president of the United States signed an executive order on July 8th, protecting access to reproductive health services. And in it, if you read the executive order, he goes deep onto privacy, including addressing a lot of concerns about threats to individual data privacy and the ability of law enforcement to use that data as a way to restrict reproductive rights. So I think that's a good thing in that executive order. There's even a link to human health services and it tells you how to protect your and secure your health info on your personal phones and tablets. I'm going to put a link to that directly in the show notes, but this is really good stuff in there. It's not only good for just health information, but it's just good as far as how to limit tracking and the giving up of your data in your personal devices. And how this ties back to organizations, in my opinion, is you should think about the data that you're collecting, whether you're developing an applications for users outside of your org or internally you should think about that data that you're collecting. Do you really need it? Should you have a retention policy for it? Should you anonymize it? Or should you even allow your users to opt out of that data being collected? Because if you, you know, the, the retention policy is important because maybe you collect all this data and you don't need it. And then you go to litigation and it's all discoverable. So do you really want 15 years of email nope. all in litigation, right? So if you don't need it, definitely implement a retention policy, which is very easy to do, and you can just get it deleted. You know, three years of retention, if you get e-discovery requests, you say, oh, we only have three years, here you go, right? That's it. So I definitely think 
um, organizations should think about should they be collecting the data? Should you be keeping it? Should you allow your users to, you know, opt out, that sort of stuff? I don't think I'm as extreme as you, Andy, on, you know, fighting the power on, uh, like, online privacy, although I, I am aware of it. And I, you know, I do take steps to limit it. I, I certainly... Um, I enabled the feature on iOS where it doesn't even ask me, like, do you want to let apps track you? It just automatically responds no to all of them without even prompting me, which is even better than getting asked, which is great. Uh, you know, what's interesting is people don't have this fundamental concept of how monetized their behavior is. And so this is not really a plug for, again, Andy and I's employer, but I think it's worth pointing out because it helps illustrate how valuable your search activity is. So as I once told a customer who was upset that we sell a product for money on the charge that Microsoft is run by staunch capitalists, I can confirm that is the case. Microsoft is very interested in making money um, as any good capitalist organization would be. And we run a search engine. And yes, it is the butt of many jokes. Although, on a total side note, I would encourage you, if you've never given this a shot, change your default search engine to Bing for like a month and like force yourself to stick with it. And I think you'll find that some of the ways it displays search results are literally better. Um, and it has some really nice um, additional like information, cards, data overlays when you do different searches. It's actually really good. Uh, most people just assume it's bad like Apple Maps and they haven't tried it in forever and are pleasantly surprised at how good it actually is. Um, but that's not really my point. My point is there's this concept called Bing Rewards and you can do these little activities like quick little hunts every day or whatever. I mean, it'll literally take you 90 seconds a day. And if you diligently stick with that, you can make like points that are redeemable for like real money um, without a whole lot of effort. I know like me personally, I'm without basically trying um, like 95% of the way to a hundred dollar Microsoft gift card, like that I can use to buy Xbox games or whatever. And there's other gift cards too. And then also there's like Bing rebates. And that also is like tied into your search history and using edge and all that. Um, but you can get money back on like when you shop online. And so I just checked mine the other day and again, like have not even tried to use it, but like I have $56 in there. So like, again, without making like a major effort to like game the system or like make money from this, I've got 150 bucks sitting there now. No, I mean like, again, it's not a crazy amount of money, but it just shows you that even a company that exists for the purpose of making money can throw you a bone and give some back to you. And that's how much like your activity is worth. Like you as a person and your attention is worth a tremendous amount of money to Google. You know, and so that's just something to think about as you, as you think about privacy and everything else. And maybe you just say, I don't care. I like targeted ads and you know, that's fine, but just be aware that you have value and you're not wrong to demand a return on your investment too. So just something to think about. Um, I think the conversation on mobile apps was interesting, especially around the menstruation tracking applications, because I'm of two minds on this. I always kind of thought Roe v. Wade would never be overturned and anybody who was saying it would be was overreacting. So I'm really hesitant at this point to ever say someone's overreacting again when they have concerns about this. Um, I would not say based on my understanding and I am not a lawyer of the burden of proof in a criminal court being beyond a reasonable doubt that you could prove something beyond a reasonable doubt just with menstruation tracking data that is self-tracked. You know, there's no proof that it's even right. However, it can be used as, as part of a larger uh, corpus of evidence. And I think that is still concerning. And so it's a great question to ask, like, how is my personal health data being used and, and to understand that. So there's going to be a link in the show notes for that, that link to health and human services um, and, and how uh, mobile devices uh, collect your personal health data. Apple does an amazing job with this, by the way, as usual with privacy related stuff. They have something called Apple Health Kit, which is like a central repository where all your health data is stored. Um, 
And we've talked about how, like with your iCloud backups, how some things are not encrypted to the point where under subpoena, they could still be viewed. HealthKit data is. HealthKit data is encrypted even when backed up to iCloud with a second key that would not be accessible to law enforcement if they subpoenaed Apple for your iCloud data. So as an example, if you were using a menstruation tracking app that only stored that data in HealthKit, it would be secure even if there was a subpoena um, from law enforcement there. So that's interesting and worth knowing more about and understanding how that stuff works. There are good protections there. However, HealthKit is also something that any application can ask permission to read and write. So I have a Wi-Fi enabled scale um, from what was Nokia Health and is now back to Withings Health. And it asked to like read everything in my health kit and then upload it to their cloud. Does it have the same protections? I bet not. And so all I have to do is say, yeah, you can read everything from health kit. And now it's created a copy of it and uploaded it to another cloud. And that's real, real easy to do. So I think the challenge here ultimately is, is me as somebody who has like a real deep understanding of this stuff and is a technologist. Like I get that. Do most people understand that? Probably not. Like it's way too difficult to maintain the privacy of everything for your average user because for all the well-intentioned Apple technical design that's super secure and super private and really good, then you get the ability to, well, let other apps read your health kit data and then they can fetter that off to another cloud and you're, you're no better off. You know, now it's in multiple clouds with much inferior protection against unreasonable search and seizure and blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's even stored overseas with even worse privacy. Who knows? Um, it's, it's so easy to do because all you have to do is like agree to one pop-up on your phone and now it's created copies of all your health data. And you don't really understand that or get made aware of the implications of that. And I don't know, there's not really a good way to handle that because short of like Apple saying, no, you can't do that. Then of course, all these companies, you know, the uh, Fitbits of the world start screaming in agony. Ah, Apple's not letting us read health kit data. Apple's keeping it all for themselves. Apple's a monopoly. Blah. And all they're trying to do is protect people's privacy, but it doesn't come off that way because, you know, Apple can be very monolithic in their response and blah, blah, blah. Like, I mean, what do you do? It comes back to, I mean, what I was talking about earlier with organizations, like there aren't always good answers to this stuff. And it's so hard in a digital 21st century to maintain your privacy unless you're like hyper aware and hyper vigilant to it. And that's a problem, but I don't have the answers for how to fix it. And so that's really concerning. So I appreciated this. I mean, making women aware of their menstruation data and how it may be used or misused is really, really helpful. But do we have really easy, actionable tips for them to do it better? I think of the same thing of like, whenever you're watching like the nightly news or something and you know, they'll report that local bank X was hacked and that people should change their passwords and they should do this and they should set complex passwords. And like, ultimately like, is anybody watching the local news and saying, gosh, okay, I better go, you know, get right on that. And like, is that even the right advice? Because I think what the real right advice is you should go buy one password and you should go generate a password for every account. But like, instead we get the, you need to change your password every 90 days and you need to have all these different character sets in it. And you know, every site should be a different password. It's like nobody can do because we're human and we can't memorize that crap. And, and so like it's well-intentioned advice that just goes into the ether that gets repeated over and over again, that does nobody any good does not raise the security game of anyone. And I feel like that's kind of where we're at now with privacy in the same way it was with security, where we know like the same advice repeated over and over, but it's not actionable. It's not meaningful because it's not simple enough and repeatable enough for most people to do. And so that's, that's just deeply concerning and I feel like it's almost a downer to talk about all this without some answers, but you know, I think our next section, Andy, we're going to talk about a couple of tools for privacy control. So maybe we can give our listeners at least a couple tips on how to up their privacy game. Yeah. I just wanted to add in here some tools that I use, um, that, you know, our circle of friends use and that can kind of help mitigate, you know, some of these signals that, 
uh, track you. So the first one, which a lot of people may not know about, is called Global Privacy Control. And GPC, it's a new proposal. And what it is, is essentially the new do not track. And if you are familiar or, or not, I guess, of the history of do not track, it's a setting within browsers. And you can check it off. But there was always this warning after a few years in the last few years where it says, hey, this may not always be honored. And that's because it was a voluntary standard that required good faith cooperation from parties that you're actually you know, getting that is hosting that website to honor that do not track. And a lot of times they were like, well, we're just going to go ahead and not give you personalized ads, but we're still going to store that data, which was kind of a way around that do not track because it wasn't enforceable. And so GPC is global privacy control. It's a new experimental protocol for communicating opt out requests that align with the privacy laws like CCPA and GDPR. And for example, the California AG has already endorsed GCP. And the idea is that it will be able to be legally binding because, Cal- like, you know, in exa- an example here, California residents can opt out of having their data sold. Same thing with GDPR. Having it legally binding. And enforceable, the hope is that companies will start to apply and comply with that request. And so if you haven't seen it before, go to um, the website, which is, look for it now, I think it's uh, globalprivacycontrol.org. And there's a lot of different ways that you can implement it. A lot of it is done by an extension. Firefox has it built in under the uh, about colon config. So you can go and turn it on directly within Firefox if you're using Firefox, but other browsers, even Chrome, you can just put a um, extension on and it will send the GPC signal, the you know do not track signal so that sites that you go to will get the signal and hopefully comply. Speaking of Firefox, one of the things that they recently did talking about this tyranny of the default is they enabled their total cookie protection for all users of Firefox and total cookie protection is something that Firefox has been working towards for years, starting in 2018 with their enhanced tracking protection or ETP which was turned on by default in 2019. And then they came out with this total cookie protection, which was tested in ETP strict mode and then in private browsing and then Firefox focus, which is their mobile browser. And now it's turned on by default for everybody. And the way it works is, you know, we haven't really dived into cookies, but cookies, you know, and now everyone knows kind of a little bit about cookies because you get that pop up everywhere, which is due to GDPR, where do you want to accept all these cookies and or not? Or do you want to go through and pick which cookies you want to go through? But what how cookies have kind of worked in the past is in a browser, they all go into one repository, call it a cookie jar, right? <laughs> and these sites wherever you browse can use these cookies in the one cookie jar. So if I go to my Gmail and then I go to Facebook and you know, these sites will use third party cookies. And what they do is since they're all in the same jar, sites can then use these same cookies to then track you across all of your behavior, which was not really why cookies were, were designed in the first place. Cookies are actually very, Uh, useful right they can do things like save your preferences they can manage your session so that you're still signed in they can um, you know deliver third-party content but they weren't really designed to track you that's how they're used today and so what firefox has done which is really ingenious is they've made every single domain every site that you visit have its own cookie jar. And so 
you can still have third-party cookies, but they stay in that jar. And so if I go to facebook.com, all those cookies goes into the facebook.com cookie jar. If I go to then gmail.com, all those cookies are in the gmail.com cookie jar. It cannot see or read any of the cookies that are in the facebook.com cookie jar, which is great because now cookies can't track you across all of your web content. It's estimated that, you know, already orgs are losing money like Google and Facebook and other companies that depend on this as far as making money. They've, they've lost a lot already. And it's just going to continue, I think. Um, Apple Safari has similar features called intelligent tracking prevention. Both Edge and Chrome do have the ability to block third-party cookies. And Chrome is actually working on phasing out third-party cookie support completely. But... Blocking third-party cookies is not always good because some of those third-party cookies will actually deliver features or content that you actually need as part of that site. It's that cross-site tracking where it's going from one site to another and using the same cookies to track you. That's what's bad. And the solution up until now has been just, let's just block all third-party cookies, which can break sites. But the way that Firefox has done it, I just think is ingenious because it gives its own you know cookie jar per site so you can still have third-party cookies it just doesn't allow you to track them across those sites so that's new by default it's great you know i personally use firefox for my personal browsing i use edge and bing for my work stuff but i always have firefox and i use DuckDuckGo as my search engine on my personal stuff so I usually have two browsers up. If it's a personal thing, I'll, I'll go to Firefox. If it's a work thing, I'll go to Edge. So that's something new that's coming out for Firefox. And then finally, DNS tracking. I just kind of want to talk about this. Number one, you know, there's a thing out there called Piehole. It's a fun thing to play with. It's a great little project if you're just trying to get into information security. It can run on a pretty much anything, including a Raspberry Pi. And it's an ad blocker, you know, a tracker blocker. And what it does is it takes DNS requests. So it's essentially a DNS server. You have to point your DNS to that internal server. So you have to go into your router and specify the DNS for your internal Pi hole server, 192.168.1. whatever it is. And then you can pull in these different repositories of DNS you know, domains that have been built up over the years as trackers that people have these repositories and you just add them to your pie hole. And essentially if it requests that specific DNS, it will just black hole it, right? It won't go anywhere. Um, and so you'll end up with much less traffic and a lot less ads on your network. What I've moved to recently is something called NextDNS, which is a modernized and what I would call a sassified pie hole on steroids. It includes like parental controls, content web filtering, as well as the ability to pull in these repositories of ad blocking and add those on there. If you don't want to do that because it does cost money, you can use something like Quad9, I use Quad9, which is 9.9.9.9, and that's a privacy-oriented DNS provider. Um, Cloudflare is Quad Ones. Um, there's Open DNS. You could use DNSSEC. But what I would recommend is don't ever put in, you know, Quad Eight or Quad Four, which is Google. A lot of people will use that when they're testing things or whatever. Uh, personally, I try to stay away from anything Google. So. Um, if you're not wanting to use any of these other tools, which do require some infrastructure or payment, you know, my recommendation, which I used for years is quad nine. So you touched on a lot there, Andy, and, and, you know, just kind of opine on a couple of things here. So I started at Microsoft in March of 2017 and GDPR was not yet in effect. And there are a lot of organizations that were very, very concerned about GDPR compliance, becoming compliant with it. 
And the thought process was it was the beginning of a sea change. You know, we talked about CCPA was coming and all these other states were going to be right behind California with implementing their own. And now here we are five and a half years later, and it's still CCPA and, and not a whole heck of a lot else. And I think we've seen that GDPR for all its good intention um, in typical European Union fashion, uh, the implementation left a little to be desired where um, I think their heart is in the right place, but sometimes they go about things the wrong way with a lot of the uh, uh, implementation they try to do. So um, I would love to see more consumer privacy focused laws come into effect. Um, I think there was a thought process once upon a time that we were at the beginning of a sea change. But then again, I think people completely overestimated the willingness of our legislative bodies to do anything valuable to individuals um, as opposed to just scoring political points. So uh, I would love to see more privacy focused laws, but unfortunately not. But just having CCPA in effect and, and growing with like adding GPC to it, um, putting some legal teeth behind GPC would be really cool. GPC being the global privacy control that Andy talked about a moment ago. So I'm cautiously optimistic, but not going to hold my breath. Firefox has been crushing it for years on building a more user-friendly, more private browser. Um, it's honestly too bad that they have such little market share. And it's honestly too bad that, you know, so many sites today, we're, we're kind of like at the, the redo of the 90s where people made sites that just worked on Internet Explorer and didn't try any other browser engines. We're almost to the point now where, you know, everyone just makes a run in Chromium and calls it a day and maybe check Safari a little bit because, you know, Safari is still a pretty big deal in the United States with iOS and iPadOS. Um, but Firefox is like this, you know, kind of afterthought anymore. And that's too bad. It reminds me of kind of Opera's old position, which, you know, Opera was really <laughs> did a lot of innovative stuff too. So I uh, love that they're doing this. Apple has done a lot in Safari as well. But, um, you know, browsers could certainly do more. I will say if you like Chromium browsers, obviously I can't help but give a plug for Edge. Edge does have some tracking protection built into it. Um, tracking prevention, I guess I should say. And the default behavior is a balanced tracking prevention, but there is a strict tracking prevention in it that does implement some, you know, similar ideas as well. So you can actually use Edge um, and kind of crank up the, the privacy in that browser. Or if you just want a browser that's built from the up, ground up, really privacy centric, but is Chromium based, you could look at Brave as well, B-R-A-V-E, uh, is a very, very good browser, very, very private and secure, but has the support and compatibility you'd expect from a Chromium engine based browser. So a couple options there as well. Uh, DNS tracking security. Uh, it, it's interesting to me to hear the guys geek out over some of this stuff like next DNS and all that. I personally am just running Cloudflare DNS um, on, on my network here. Uh, just no real care and feeding um, required, but then my uh, router I'm currently on a TP link does have a subscription service that does additional blocking and control on top of it. Um, I had something similar when I was on an Eero system, Eero Secure used uh, some Zscaler technology to help protect. Um, I'm not exactly sure, you know, how the TP-Link works under the covers, but I do know it, it does block a fair amount of trackers as well. So you can kind of come at this from multiple angles. Obviously having a browser helps. You can also come at it from an angle of your DNS and PyHull or NextDNS are really configurable ways to do it. But even if you don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, you can certainly just fire up your router configuration window. And instead of using the DNS settings from your ISP, you can change them to one of those good uh, publicly accessible DNS servers. And almost all of them do some level of filtering as well. Cloudflare definitely does a good amount of that. Um, and Andy, you talked about quad nine. You really like that as well. So nine, 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 one, 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 those are all really good ones to check out, um, as well. So some, some good tips there for sure. And again, not all, none of those require like a lot of ongoing effort. It's just using a browser that's more privacy respecting, which is basically anything not named Chrome is going to be an improvement. Um, and then uh, with the DNS stuff as well, that's kind of a set it and forget it thing. Unless you really want to constantly geek out about it, you can. 
or you can just set it and forget it to something and at least up your game a little bit there too. So some good thoughts there for sure. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching and listening as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or future topics you want us to talk about. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAWZERO and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.